Hello, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. Welcome to this um, second um, series uh, them, uh, of the um, learning series of the GPC um, on improving um, protection analysis. Today's session is um, around how we can strengthen human rights and legal analysis. Um, my name is Samane Hassanli. I am I'm the legal officer with the Global Protection Cluster here based in Geneva. Um, and today I have with me two very special guests, um, Saeed Al-Mathoun um, from OHCHR and uh, also Brennan uh, Webert from uh, DRC. Um, thank you, Saeed and Brennan for joining us. And um, welcome everybody. We hope to may have this session as interactive as possible. Um, so we have prepared a presentation that will take you through. And then after the presentation, um, we open the session for questions um, and answers. Um, I would appreciate if everybody could please, if you haven't already done so, um, introduce yourselves in the chat in the interest of time. I think we have uh, quite a number of audience, so um, we won't um, do a tour de table, but if you can please introduce yourselves, your name, your um, role, the agency that you work in, and your location in the chat so we can get to know each other. And um, uh, if you have a question after the presentation, um, if your um, internet allows, please do um, open your um, camera so we can see you and get to know you better. Thank you so much. Uh, so without further ado, I would... Uh, just... I'm going to share the presentation. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can okay. see. Perfect, thank you. Um, so today's session, as I mentioned, is on uh, strengthening human rights and legal analysis. Um, the objective of this session is um, to better ground protection analysis in human rights and legal frameworks. Um, we all know that human rights is at the core of humanitarian um, action. So we hope that um, with the tools that we introduced to you today and um, with the presentation, we will be able to uh, provide you with some um, you know, tools uh, to better ground your protection analysis in human rights and legal frameworks. We hope that through this analysis. Uh, Let me show you. Excuse me if you can um, mute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we hope that through this, uh, this analysis will contribute to improved uh, um, products, including HNOs, HRPs, your protection analysis updates, and other key documents, which ultimately would um, improve and enhance advocacy at country, regional, and uh, global levels. Um, today's session is particularly focused on um, a tool that we would, uh, Saeed would introduce kindly. Um, uh, this tool was developed uh, jointly by OHCHR and the Global Protection Cluster. Um, um, and um, we will take you through the, uh, the matrix. Um, basically, um, I will hand over to Saeed to take you through, but um, just to let you know the reason why um, we thought that this would be helpful. Um, you are quite familiar with the protection um, analysis framework, um, the 15 risks. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis and tools and trainings to be able to um, uh, you know, harmonize the approach. Um, so um, the, the, this matrix actually uh, links the 15 risks, uh, protection risks to human rights uh, framework um, to the different instruments. Um, and the objective is uh, basically to um, improve um, um, a shared language um, um, because sometimes their protection risk might not necessarily uh, talk the same language as human rights. And also um, to um, give uh, you know, the, the tools and mechanisms 
mechanisms, the various human rights mechanisms to advocate and the channels to for you to advocate at different levels. Um, so with that introduction, I will hand over to Saeed, who has been at the uh, forefront of, um, you know, the uh, development of this tool. Um, Saeed, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Samane, uh, for introducing me, and thanks for the Global Protection Cluster for convening this uh, webinar, which comes among a series of learning series on information and analysis. So from my side, um, I'll give just an overview first of what do we mean by human rights and, and, uh, and, and generally what uh, what entails um, uh, as as a concept, and then we move into pre to presenting the human rights matrix, and also we will show you uh, some good examples from current uh, protection an analysis updates that have been developed by uh, some of the national protection clusters, and also uh, we have a few messages to you that you can uh, take forward. Um, so basically, uh, as uh, Samana mentioned, uh, the effort was basically to how we can ensure that we, we speak the same language, we understand protection risks in a meaningful way and also in a rights-based way. So basically, human rights as a definition, these are legal instruments. Uh, they are universal, they guarantee the protection of the human rights of individuals and groups. So we speak whether civil political rights, economic, social, cultural rights or collective rights. Uh, and it's against the actions and omissions that interferes with the fundamental freedoms, entitlements and human dignity. So whether actions or omissions or, or, or certain parties, they need to fulfill certain entitlements, but they fail to do so. So whether it's actions or omissions that results in violations of um, freedoms and other entitlements. Uh, human rights is, is the minimum uh, that everybody should enjoy, regardless of any political system or economic system that exists in any country. Uh, it's inherent in the uh, each person's uh, human dignity. Uh, it cannot be denied to any person or a group except with a due process and in specific situations. We also consider human rights and as interrelated and interdependent. A violation of one right could result in a violation of a series of rights. If we look at uh, the right to identity or a right to documentation, uh, any violation of such right could lead to a series of rights, whether to right to assistance or to right to be recognized as displaced or as a refugee or etc etc so all these rights uh, they they uh, reinforce each other and they are in interdependent and the realization of one right could also lead to the realization of several rights if you have the right to information you you can access information uh, as you need, then you are able to make informed decisions and, and you are uh, able to make informed choices. Um, I'll move now to the next slides and, and we need to understand human rights in terms of who is a duty bearer and who is a right holder. And when it comes to the states, they are the ones that they are um, concerned by the human rights frameworks. Uh, and they have certain duties to fulfill when it comes to their obligations. And these obligations comes from, if you know of those instruments, whether Universal Declaration of Human Rights or other covenants and conventions or other uh, uh, less legally binding documents, guiding principles or uh, declarations or guidelines. Uh, so these commitments have, have uh, three layers and and both uh, reinforce each other and and if we come to the first two uh, types respect and protect we call them immediate obligations which means uh, the states have uh, direct obligations as part of their um, international uh, obligations uh, and with regard to the first one the states has to respect those rights which means refraining from uh, interfering with the enjoyment of the rights. And this is 
uh, whether it's the states, it's the state agents, it's, whether it's police officer, law enforcement, a teacher or a doctor or any of the state's uh, blind ministries, etc., that may have interfered with this right. The other uh, immediate obligation is also to prevent others, whether we we would call them non-state actors, but that could include a range of other actors, whether it is an organized honor group, a gang, private businesses, uh, and, uh, and 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 ma many 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 other actors, even private individuals, individuals acting on their capacity. And and you come and encounter those particular protection risks. For example, if we speak about thefts, uh, for example private individuals are responsible, how we see that in the terms of human rights framework, what obligations lie with the state when we analyze this particular protection risk. And also uh, a number of, of, of those human rights violations are codified. Uh, for example, if we speak about exploitation, trafficking, in many countries they are criminalized, but there might be in other contexts they are not criminalized. So. In, when we do our human rights analysis, we need to consider not only the national frameworks, but also the national frameworks that seeks to enforce those international commitments and to what extent um, international uh, national laws confirm with the commitments of international uh, obligations of the state. And the last one is about fulfilling uh, those rights when it comes to measures. And here we speak more about policies, legislations uh, and programs. And, and when you look uh, at your uh, protection egg model and you look about environment building, then I think this particular fulfillment fits into the, the, uh, uh, the fulfillment side. Uh, so just to give you an example, horse eviction, it falls under the three of them. So the states needs to, when they do forced eviction, they need to, to respect the law through certain procedures, judicial procedures to give all the remedies, uh, whether this eviction is taking place in line with the law for certain. So again, they have a respect to do that. Uh, when it comes to protecting, if if the eviction is happening by private individuals, they have also certain measures that they need to put in place to protect those affected. And when it comes to fulfillment, they need to ensure that the law is there to protect those individuals. So we speak about three layers, respect, protect and fulfill. And, and when it comes to progressive realization, uh, I mean, that applies a lot into um, the, the framework of economic, social, cultural rights, because capacities and resources and also uh, budgets and uh, budgetary allocations, all of that may play into the factor, but, but at least when it comes to each single right, the state needs to do the minimum and to make available the minimum. That's, I think, the basic foundation of a human right. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, and uh, and in this slide, I'll, I'll prefer to go into straight to the matrix. And so we can present those particular elements and, and we will go through the Excel uh, spreadsheet and uh, we will look into the protection risk of uh, discrimination and, and we present the matrix uh, through that. Um, uh, Samana, just a you, moment, you, yes, just a moment, okay. Said, I'm bringing okay. it up, Thank sorry. You. No problem. Said, are you seeing it? Yeah, I can see it, uh, but yes. we need to zoom yes. in uh, into uh, no. discrimination. Yeah, so basically uh, with it comes to the protection risk discrimination, uh, you, you have you seen an umbrella of protection risks that includes discrimination, 
stigmatization and denial um, of uh, assistance and resources, etc. But let's go to the first one when it comes to discrimination. So basically, when it comes to discrimination, not everything could be counted as discrimination, but it, it, it has to meet a definition that comes from the human rights uh, framework. Uh, I can't see very well uh, the, uh, but I'll use uh, my Excel sheet. So basically I can uh, read in, um, in a better way. So basically when it comes to discrimination, uh, uh, so for example, um, you need, uh, I mean, basically in every, um, when we go into each protectionist definition, it automatically identifies uh, when you go through the dashboard, the related human rights violations, uh, whether they are direct violations of this particular protection risk or other related human rights. So for example, when it comes to discrimination, uh, it can be uh, a discrimination could lead also to a, a, a range of human rights violations. So um, uh, what are the standards to establish a, a violation when it comes to discrimination? So basically uh, discrimination is a violation which involves a distinction, exclusion, restriction or preference made based on the basis of race, age, color, which has the purpose or effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment or exercise on an equal footing with others. And, and when the treatment is not reasonably and objectively justified or fails to pursue a legitimate aim. Here, the, the language is basically, if you want, if the state or others discriminate, uh, this kind of discrimination, it has to be informed and justified and and it has to fail uh, uh, to pursue a legitimate aim. Uh, also, uh, a violation uh, when it comes to discrimination uh, takes place if a state official or institution fails to exercise due diligence in investigating allegations of discrimination. And, and this is basically when it comes to the right to, the, the, to be protected or the obligation of the state to protect people from discrimination, uh, especially when it comes by non-state actors or when the state fails to sanction and provide an effective remedy for discrimination when it occurs. So uh, uh, basically the human rights tell us what, what, how we define discrimination and what are the cases and situations where the state could be violating this particular right. So it kind of codifies what is the conduct and what are the, the elements of the obligations of the state when it comes to discrimination. So it's not only about the state cannot discriminate, but also it cannot allow others, uh, including non-state actors, to discriminate. But also, the the state is in violation of discrimination if it also fails to sanction and provide an effective remedy. Uh, uh, and also, the law tells us, for example, there is a public emergency in the states uh, that threatens the life of the nation and the existence. The states may take measures derogating from the obligations under ICCPR provided they are not discriminatory. So in times of emergency, if the state uh, uh, puts in place certain uh, rules, for example, when it comes freedom of expression, freedom of association, uh, any such derogations of those rights should not be discriminatory. Um, uh, and also, if you look into within this box, it also mentions other, other types of violations, for example, if, if the government fails to adapt or enforce a legislation, or when it fails to adapt all appropriate, immediate and effective measures to prevent, diminish and eliminate the conditions, attitudes and prejudices which cause or perpetuates discrimination. So, and here we, we look more, if, if even if the state fails to take those uh, fulfillment measures to ensure that 
the policies and and the states and also should should work to influence attitudes through education and and all um and also and what Sorry, yeah. Sorry. colleagues can I, can you please mute colleagues can you so you need to go the new one uh, uh, and also, if the government or the state fails to take uh, or implement concrete, temporary, special or spe uh, specific measures aimed at realizing the de facto substantive equality. So uh, this is just an example of, of what the law says. But uh, uh, what we need to consider, the law is telling us or giving us an approach where lies the the responsibility of the state when it comes to discrimination so when you tackle any of those particular part protection risks and you see certain groups are uh, by uh, the rights are being violated you need to consider why this particular group perhaps you need to look into some root causes what drives this particular group as vulnerable is it because poverty is it because illiteracy is it because and and perhaps the only way to ensure equality is for the state to take certain appropriate measures or to put in some temporary arrangements to ensure this particular group enjoys this particular right and to to protect them from uh, this discrimination so if you go um, into uh, the matrix on the right then you can see the relevant uh, uh, articles, of, uh, whether it's from the Declaration of Human Rights, the Covenant on Civil Political Rights, the uh, the Covenant on the Racial Discrimination, uh, and discrimination is across all um, human rights instruments when it comes to discrimination against women, uh, people with disabilities, uh, migrants, uh, people that belong to national ethnic religious minorities. Uh, there is also uh, ILO, the International Labour Organization Discrimination uh, uh, con Convention. So this basically this is your reference. So if if you think one day to uh, and and I I think that that could identify certain venues. So when when you speak about those particular protection risks. If if it's about lack of knowledge or education, then you, you, we we need in a way to ensure that we understand where why these kind of uh, safeguards for protection come from. They come from these uh, codes and uh, codified instruments uh, of international law. And when 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 you look at those tools, then we need to consider the ratification and the accession of the states to this particular instrument because uh, in international law when a country uh, accedes or ratifies an instrument they may put some reservations on particular articles uh, i'll give you within the slides at, uh, like there's a, an online tool you can access you can look on any particular state what is the status of the ratification and what kind of uh, reservations they have made when it comes to each particular um, uh, 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 convention or treaty. The second, uh, the following uh, one is about those particular mechanisms. And across the metrics, you will not only see uh, the binding instruments. So we included not only the conventions and the treaties, but also we included other kinds of soft law, whether it's guiding principles, guidelines uh, as well as also uh, there are some kind of codes or uh, non-binding treaties um, we also aim to include some some examples from regional instruments but it's not across the uh, the matrix uh, but when it comes to this particular matrix i want you to consider that this is a work in progress we 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 worked on this matrix over a period of three to six months, but uh, we need to update and populate as we go, because human rights law is an evolving law. Every year, hundreds of recommendations and findings are coming out from the work of the human rights treaty bodies, 
from the special rapporteurs, um, uh, from the universal periodic review, and we need to to catch up. Uh, and we will help you to do that uh, as as OECHR uh, in the future. Uh, so after we go finish from the mechanisms, we move into the other related rights. As I mentioned, all rights are interrelated and interdependent. So for example, if we look at domestic violence and discrimination against women, uh, that could lead to women being unable to access a range of rights when it comes to inheritance, housing, land and property, access to resources, humanitarian assistance. Uh, so these particular rights, they are there. And and I think this applies. So it, 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 when it comes to 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 a, a large number of the protection risks, you can say it's it applies to multiple rights. Uh, one right could violate or lead to a series and a range of of violations. Um, if we go uh, right uh, to the next one, we included some examples. Of from uh, from findings from treaty bodies, uh, some mandated uh, human rights council reports. Uh, when it comes to what what findings they have made when it comes to uh, certain particular groups, whether it be it women, children, uh, displaced people, uh, minorities. Uh, uh, so, for example, if we just look into this uh, uh, example. Uh, it talks about this positive discrimination. So, for example, special measures taken for the sole purpose of securing adequate advancement of certain groups or individuals requiring such a protection as may be necessary shall not be deemed discrimination. So when we talk about uh, when when a state takes measures to protect certain group in order to ensure they are able to advance and also to develop, such measures must be taken of limited duration and must cease when the discrimination has been addressed. Um, uh, and also, for example, uh, uh, there were examples of hate speech in one country, and basically the recommendation on the state was to take steps to address xenophobic attitudes and behaviors towards non-citizens. If we talk about migrants or uh, or other people, uh, hate speech and racial violence and counter any tendency to target, stigmatize, stereotype or to profile people based on the race or nationality or ethnic uh, origin. So this is uh, across the matrix. You will see those particular examples. As I mentioned, uh, this is a work in progress. We will aim to update uh, as much regularly as possible in order to to also equip you with all um, up to date information and analysis that comes from uh, treaty bodies and other mechanisms. Uh, if we can go back now to the presentation. Um, shall we Sorry move to say, the next can I slide? Can yes. I just come in? Sorry, maybe I can also just show the dashboard uh, to colleagues. I think it would be good because um, there's a lot of effort um, gone, as um, Said mentioned, into this. However, there is also um, a dashboard that um, I think makes it a bit easier to navigate through um, uh, what Said has presented. The reason that we decided to present the um, the um, Excel sheet today is because that we realized that the matrix doesn't have the last column, but basically this is how currently the um, the um, matrix, the, the dashboard looks like here. It's easier to navigate. You've got the 15 protection risks that I think all of the colleagues are very familiar with um, because it's been presented numerously um, through their protection analytical framework. So you can, for instance, um, Said was um, discussing about um, discrimination today, so you checked discrimination and it brings up the various blocks that um, say it took you through um, so and you can navigate this um, easy um, so we are um, it is already available and thanks to Francesco he has uh, also um, included the link to this dashboard and um, we are as say it said it's a work in progress we are just um, updating a few more information but it's already available so for colleagues to use um, but um, thank you said with that I'll go back uh, to the presentation I just wanted to make sure that colleagues are aware that we also have a dashboard online.
we will skip this one. Yes. Um, I'll, 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 this um, right space protection analysis, this equation comes uh, from the uh, human rights uh, monitoring manual of OSHR. Uh, but uh, just to amplify what what I was speaking through in the um, in the matrix, uh, the additional element to your protection risk equation is is basically the commitment part, and this commitment part basically comes from the obligations to to protect, uh, to respect and protect and fulfill. Um, and uh, and uh, basically, I don't want to present the threat and vulnerability and capacity, but uh, perhaps you're already aware of that. So if we can skip uh, those uh, threat, vulnerability, capacity, uh, but just to speak when it comes to commitment, a uh, commitment is about the political will of the state uh, to to uh, to address and also to stop a violation. So uh, for example. Uh, any violation uh, that happens, the state has to ensure that uh, 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 this, uh, as as we looked into the uh, uh, the discrimination example, the state has first to sanction and 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 to ensure those who are responsible uh, are are uh, are accounting for for their ac their actions, especially when it comes to private actors or other non-state actors. Uh, and also when state agents are, are doing the violation, they are also accounting, and which means accountability. The other thing is to ensure that this is not happening again, which is to stop and prevent those violations from happening. So, and, and that's, I think that does amplify uh, why we need uh, th this accountability part when it comes to the, to the, to the human rights based analysis. Uh, and, and as you look when it comes to vulnerability and capacity as the two sides of the coin, so the more you reduce vulnerability, the, uh, the more you need to do on capacity, the same thing when it comes reduction of threats. You need to stop threats from happening. You need, when, when you do your monitoring and your data collection, you need to say whether this particular risk is increasing or decreasing, whether uh, this means like threat and commitment. Uh, if if the threat should be reduced, then we need to ensure that the authorities and the states is more committed and we are seeing increased commitment from the state that they are uh, responding to, to uh, whatever uh, allegations we bring to them and they are acting upon them uh, and they are able to get, provide the remedies for the people who are affected by those particular violations. Uh, should we move next? Uh, this with regard to the protection and analytical framework, uh, this, I mean, everybody is, is familiar with that and, uh, and again, we, we, we are not inventing a new thing, but uh, we we would like to encourage you to to take into your uh, analysis the the not only the capacities but also the commitment side. Um, I don't know if you want to add more on that, um, uh, Samani. No, thank you, Say. Just to just to make sure that colleagues, because I think um, colleagues uh, who are here today, they they are familiar, quite familiar, I would hope so, with the protection analytical framework. So what what Said presented in the previous slide is actually, um, you know, it's the same thing that we have here. It's just another articulation here that uh, you have seen this, and I just wanted to make sure that colleagues might not get confused. Uh, basically, it's the same thing here. Just what Said has added is in this gray area box that we talk about capacities. It's also about the commitment uh, and willingness of the government actually besides the capacity to be able to um, uh, you know undertake their human rights obligations so is um, you you sometimes hear that a state is unable so that goes back to capacity or unwilling to so that willingness is also important and what Said is suggesting is also that we you know we include that in our analysis but uh, basically we're not uh, it's the same uh, you know analysis uh, framework that we're using thank you Said. Thank you. Uh, should we go to the last slide uh, before um, we we give also the floor for uh, Brennan? Uh, uh, if if I would like to summarize when it comes to any protection risk analysis that you're doing, 
basically we need to look into the law whether it is the uh, commitment of the states what kind of ratification what treaties what international obligations they have but also in terms of national legislation national policies uh, national executive directives or or the lack of policy or the lack of legislation when it comes to the protection of this particular risk the second part is when it comes to their obligations to ensure the protection from those threats what they are doing are they doing enough to protect those particular rights or not uh, and also how they ensure that everybody uh, they are aware and they are able to seek the information when it comes to those particular uh, protection issues or risks. The, uh, the part of this analysis is about the protection and the support services. Again, it's the states that has to ensure that those are affected by those protection issues and threats are able to access protection and support services. And here, a human rights-based approach basically should, it should be around a few things, a few standards, availability, acceptability, uh, it's of good quality, physically and economically accessible to all without discrimination. So uh, this, is, this is just basic. This is the minimum that uh, all states should, should ensure. Uh, and when it comes to then this particular analysis is who has been left behind, who is most vulnerable, who is less advantaged to, to access uh, those protection and support services. And number five is about the remedies. What are the available remedies to access? Uh, uh, and, and also, is there any restitution, rehabilitation for people to recover from the protection uh, threats? And this comes here also to the what specific arrangements or procedures, whether they, even they are, they are temporary to protect specific groups. And, and this comes again, uh, uh, the legislation and the law is important, but sometimes you need to take urgent steps to protect, for example, people with disabilities. This means even if you get some temporary protection, but these types of actions could remedy the situation for some time, but in the end, our goal is to ensure the environment and also the policies are also uh, aligned to ensure the protection. Um, moving next now, just uh, to quickly present two examples that I see they do touch upon those particular elements that I just presented. Uh, uh, our colleagues in Mozambique, they highlighted uh, forced recruitment and association of children. Uh, they, they did map the actors who are involved in child recruitment, whether non-state actors. They also touch upon the, the way the state is legalizing certain non-state actors and the support they have extended to, to these particular actors. Uh, and also they presented something related to capacities in terms of understanding what entails uh, of recruitment. The gaps in the legal system includes the lack of age verification of processes. Uh, they do uh, uh, highlight uh, the engagement uh, and also the mechanisms on the reporting on conflict, uh, children in armed conflict. Uh, and also when it comes to, to the network of services and, uh, and the current challenges to access protection and support services. So this has to do also how it mitigate the impact of those protection threats when it comes to victimization, rejection, detention, and harassment. And their recommendations, they, they are very good in terms of uh, uh, seeking uh, the, uh, the uh, endorsement of the protocols on handover and age verification, as well as also uh, towards the prevention, stopping the prosecution of children that are released uh, uh, from those uh, armed groups and the rollout of support services. So this is a very good example. Um, but uh, again, there is always a room for improvement um, for the future. The other example comes from South Sudan, 
uh, and it touch upon discrimination against people with disabilities. They have looked into the constitution. They have also looked at the signature of and ratification of the um, Convention on People with Disabilities. Uh, and also they took note of national disability inclusion and the disability action plan. Uh, but also they highlighted issues when it comes to the national disability and the inclusion policies, highlighting stigmatization, discrimination and, and challenges in accessing justice and addressing housing and other property issues. So, so these are two examples like uh, they, they, they showcase how we um, understand uh, uh protection risks using the the human rights uh, framework uh, should we move to the last slide uh, these are uh, some slides when it comes that that can be helpful for you when it comes to the ver status of verification they are part of the presentation uh, i don't need to go through uh, and the second one is about the recommendations uh, that came out uh, for each particular country. If you go into the map, you click one country, then you can go into more the details about the what the Universal Periodic Review has endorsed, treaty bodies, special procedures, etc. And uh, next, uh, just uh, I mean, these are just examples. Human Rights Council is is in its 55th session. Uh, these particular countries are coming into the discussion and there are certain um, OSHR mandated reports will be presented and discussed. Uh, and also there are uh, some reports by the UN experts mandate holders when it comes to Myanmar, Afghanistan. Also the commissions uh, um, of inquiry, human rights experts of South Sudan and Colombia. Uh, next is also a slide on um, uh, the uh, Universal Periodic Review, uh, the upcoming UPRs uh, in uh, 2024 includes Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, DRC, Ethiopia, El Salvador, uh, Madagascar, Iraq. And uh, just, uh, uh, I mean, I don't need to present this one, but you will have it in the presentation. My uh, Now I'll give the floor to uh, Brennan, um, and uh, thank you very much, but we will have some questions uh, after Brennan's. Thank you. Thank you, Said And um, Brennan, um, um, if we can hand over to you. So Brennan works um, in DRC and we've asked uh, Brennan to kindly present because uh, DRC has already started uh, using the human rights uh, matrix tool. Um, as you know, the tool was developed and published um, very recently. It was published, I think, in uh, towards the end of January, but we were very happy to see uh, protection partners already starting to use that. So we've asked Brennan um, to please join us um, to, to showcase how um, um, DRC has started using the matrix. Over to you, Brennan, please. Brennan? Samane, I don't yeah. see him connected anymore. I don't know if he has oh. had a problem in internet. Okay, maybe I will skip this then and wait for Brennan to uh, join us. But um, I just wanted to re-emphasize um, a few points that um, Said had made has made throughout the per the presentation. Um, we we are here to um, you know to help and support you um, with uh, strengthening. Um, your analysis, your protection analysis, and grounding it in human rights and legal frameworks. And the, ma the matrix that has been developed and was presented, we hope, is, is a way to help you to quickly see and uh, connect the protection risk to um, uh, the, the uh, human rights uh, frameworks uh, that are linked to those. So you can actually take that language, use that language in your um, advocacy work directly with the government or elsewhere. Um, also, um, as part of the mechanisms um, 
uh, as human rights engagements that you that um, the GPC has been engaging on. We are here to support you at the global level as well. Um, if you want to engage with um, with various human rights mechanisms, as I mentioned, some of them, for instance, um, currently the Human Rights Council um, uh, so, uh, is 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 uh, uh, in, in in taking place. Um, we provided before uh, the sessions uh, two private briefings to member states and a specific country. Uh, situations. We also um, proactively um, uh, reach out or sometimes the special mandate holders um, and special rapporteurs reach out to us to arrange briefings with protection clusters and AORs. We have recently had a number of briefings um, uh, for uh, particular special um, rapporteurs on Sudan, on Myanmar and a number of other countries in DRC. Um, so these are also the other um, you know, ways that we can support you. But um, basically we, we wanted to also um, emphasize and hold Hope that um, um, at uh, by using these tools. Um the, the protection analysis will be improved because currently we, we do see a little bit of a gap in, in some of the documents, protection analysis documents that are coming forward. Um, and we would uh, we would like to see a bit and encourage a bit more use and reference to uh, human rights frameworks, legal frameworks. Um, so, um, you know, for instance, if you are talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, child rights violations, you can use the matrix and see immediately that uh, you know the international the convention on the rights of the child is relevant then you can see and uh, whether the country that you're operating in uh, has it ratified the convention on the rights of the child has it and um, if so then has it uh, um, does it have any reservations and um, and even beyond that then you can see whether they've actually um, domesticated that um, you know international convention in their laws so um, you know a little bit of that additional um, analysis um, would really help. Um, we um, uh, we have and also a number of countries, as you know. I mean, we work on internal displacement. We have a number of countries who are actively um, engaging in in um, law and policy development on IDPs, uh, uh, for instance. And we would like to see, uh, you know, at least in your HNOs and HRPs, not necessarily in your POWs, because there are uh, you know frequent updates uh, and lawmaking is a is a long procedure. But at least um, you know when you're providing that contextual situation in the country particularly at uh, certain points of your analysis that references are made for instance in these in these type of documents because then um, you know you are protection clusters are very well suited to be able to engage and 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 take the lead together with the other humanitarians with the HCT in advocating for instance enactment of these laws or if there's the laws have been implement uh, enacted but there is a bit of issue with implementation taking that implementation forward and we've seen in in countries Country context at the country level, usually when you are working with the government, um, depends which which governments, but usually when you refer to their international obligations, to their particularly if they have national frameworks, if you prefer, if you refer to their national obligations that they have already um, enacted, and particularly even going drilling down to specific articles that they might be in violation, we found that very effective at the at the uh, national level. So um, you know um, we are hoping to be able to support you with this kind of analysis and um, obligations of states. Um, but basically the key messages that we hope to share today that um, uh, you know, human rights is is at the core of humanitarian um, work. Um, so we share a common ground, and so we use the human rights uh, framework, um, uh, the human rights based approach for our humanitarian work. Um, human rights law is is a critical normative guide for protection, um, and uh, you know the law by itself does not offer immediate solutions, but it suggests approaches and it's a very strong advocacy tool to be able to, um, um, to advocate with governments to uphold their um, obligations. And uh, human rights opens the door uh, to partnerships and collaborative advocacy. Um, so these are the messages that we wanted to share. Um, I'm not sure whether Brennan has been able to join us. Uh, Francesco, do you see him online? I'm, yeah, I'm back. You're back, yeah. okay. Okay. I mean, uh, it's just as Saeed was going to hand over to me, so apologies. I'm going to no, take it's... off my camera just because I think it's still a little shaky. Okay, um, Brennan, thank you. But yeah, no, thank you for the opportunity to share experiences with the, the human rights matrix. And first, I want to thank Saeed and Francesco and colleagues at the GPC and OHCHR for 
for developing the matrix. Um, it's great and I find it a hugely helpful tool in terms of, I mean, what you've already said, ensuring that common language and linkage, linkages between protection risks and human rights. Uh, and this is where I think we've made a lot of work or progress in the GPC over the past two years. Uh, when I look at the human rights matrix that was developed, I go straight to the protection analytical framework, which you mentioned earlier. And I refer to my my, my favorite Excel sheet ever. Uh, it's uh, titled Annex One Path Analysis Tools. And there's a tab in there titled uh, Concepts Matrix. And in the concepts matrix, uh, it has a list of threats, vulnerabilities, and capacities, and it links with, you know, uh, humanitarian law provisions, human rights law. Uh, so, I mean, I kind of see that that as a precursor of what Saeed has developed. Um, you can click on the next uh, tab as well, because there's also, I think, a, a card deck uh, that is is pretty cool uh, and and a great tool. Uh, to use with teams to ensure that we're we're having uh, the same definitions and understandings of of what um, protection risks are. So this is the card deck that was developed with the protection analytical framework. And again, both of these, as well as the human rights matrix, are all kind of aiming to have clear definitions to ensure that we're speaking the same language. Um, I, I guess we can go to the next uh, tab or click. Uh, yeah, you can click the next one as well. Perfect. Um, and so, you know, this common understanding is it's important for our sector, but also important when we're talking about the centrality of protection and when we're thinking about HCTs or other sectors and ensuring that when we're talking, for example, about arbitrary detention, we all have the same definition, the understanding, and can refer to the relevant human rights violations and legal frameworks applicable. And uh, DRC has prioritized our engagement with human rights mechanisms uh, and IHL compliance and kind of harmonizing our approaches over the past year. Uh, and in doing so, we developed our uh, internal guidance and, and we incorporated the great work that the task team on human rights uh, did a few years back. They developed guidance and recommendations on how to engage with human rights mechanisms. And we we've incorporated that. Um, so with this priority, we've we've undertaken some workshops and trainings uh, with the aim of strengthening uh, our engagement with human rights mechanisms. And we were able to use the matrix in in the last workshop we did, which was super fun. Um, and so just sharing a few pictures around the activities that we did. Uh, the first one on the left, uh, we had an activity where colleagues looked at the various entry points to engaging with human rights mechanisms at the global level. So looking at special procedures, treaty bodies, and the Human Rights Council. Um, so with this activity, colleagues posted the printed out descriptions of these bodies, uh, and then looked at the specific mechanisms within each. So for example, in special procedures, we looked at the special rapporteur and IDPs as a potential entry point, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then on the right hand side, this is where you have the, the human rights matrix uh, that Saeed and colleagues have developed. And you can see a, the, the printed out version of the columns of the human rights matrix. And here I think we had the protection risk at the far left hand side, the definition of the protection risk, uh, followed by the, hu the human rights violations that link to that risk, and then the monitoring and reporting uh, opportunities at the far right. Um, so here again, colleagues populated the matrix. They worked together on this, um, and and we had, um, bu -bu 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 -bum. Uh, yeah. So again, it, it uh, links the protection risks to the definitions, to the rights violations, and then to the the, the monitoring reporting mechanisms. And this activity was great. Uh, it was a great way for teams to work together and linking these four important elements. Um, and it had the benefit of ensuring that we are working from the same definitions when we talk about our protection risks and how these protection risks link to human rights violations. And then that helped us also identify entry points via the monitoring reporting uh, descriptions noted in the matrix. And again, all this then comes together uh, to help us have a more strategic and organized approach to engaging with human rights mechanisms. Um, I'll leave it there for for now, but if there are any questions, let me know. And thanks again for letting me share the the experience with the human rights matrix. Oh, I'm sorry, Samina, you're muted.
sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Brennan. Um, and it's it's very actually, as I mentioned, it's very exciting for us to see that although the tool has not been, um, you know, released and launched uh, for a very long time, but it's already being used, I understand from uh, Brennan, in a number of countries that DRC is active. And so we hope that you also, the partners who are available today, would, would use the tool, uh, would find the tool um, helpful and use it for your various purposes. Um, in um, the presentation that we will share, we have um, uh, also indicated some um, uh, additional resources um, that uh, you know we went through today um, and some focal points if you want to reach out um, and understand a bit more about the tool, the human rights matrix, um, including Said's contact and my, myself, um, also Francesco who has been behind the overall uh, system building. Um, um, here you also have some additional um, just links. There is on the GPC website a, a training series on human rights engagements, which has eight uh, different modules. Um, that's also um, you might find that helpful for for your um, um, for your work. Um, but um, with that, um, I hope that you've uh, you found the presentation helpful. And if you have any questions, please um, please raise your hand, and um, it would be great if you're internet allows to also open your cameras. But we're here for any questions. Yes, we will uh, we will share the presentation with everyone. Yes, Angeliki, over to you. We can't hear you, Angeliki. Great, sorry. I just want to, to say hello to everyone and thanks a lot for this lovely presentation and the work you have put in, in developing the human rights matrix. Uh, I just want to briefly share two words with regards to how IRC has started using the matrix. Um, we are trying to, um, again, have like a similar exercise, but really try to align with what you have already been doing. So I think that for us, it has been very helpful uh, to look at the human rights matrix and try to reflect this in our own work and internal like tools and materials and resources. Um, we have been, again, trying to map the protection risks with specific um, legal rights, um, uh, human rights instruments uh, and try to categorize and identify human rights violations um, when analyzing protection risks, um, uh, because we want to really strengthen our protection analysis by integrating human rights language, and mostly because we want to, to link with specific risk mitigation strategies as well, but really try to identify the actors who are responsible and accountable um, to, to respond and to protect. Uh, so I think that this is a very relevant discussion, and we are very happy to, to contribute and, and continue the work with you. I uh, just wanted to say that the matrix has been quite helpful and um, and again, as some of you have already mentioned, I think it's a work in progress. Uh, and once we also finalize our uh, our approaches and tools, we're happy to share um, and see how we can complement each other's work. But again, a big thank you. And I really want to encourage everyone in this call to uh, keep working towards human rights integration and protection analysis. Thank you all. Thank you, Angeliki, for sharing also that beyond DRC, IRC has also started using it. This is very encouraging for us. It's always good to see that the tools that we've developed, um, you know, are being used in, in, in the field locations. Um, do let us know, of course, of your, um, you know, um, lessons learned, uh, how we can, because as Said mentioned, it's a work in progress. We hope to improve it. Um, so do let us know if, if you, while implementing it in the field, if you have any suggestions for um, improvement. But Said, over to you if you want to also comment. Uh, I don't want to make uh, much time, uh, but if there are other colleagues who want to come in uh, for questions, I don't know if there are any questions in the uh, in the uh, in the chat box. Uh, uh, look, I mean, uh, for, for, from my perspective, uh, the law is it's just um, it, it's a tool. It's, it's kind of it's a just an approach. But 
when it comes to what makes sense of the law, it's, it's the protection cluster actors and members and the organizations who on a day to day basis, they speak to victims, to survivors, to people affected by violations and abuses of human rights law, international internal law. So you are all doing human rights work. How the law will be helpful is is how make you make use of it, how you use those particular interpretations of the law, because the, what the treaty bodies do, what the special procedures do is they interpret the law. They pro provide you with certain standards. And also what they are helpful uh, when it comes to your work is, is not only about the long term vision in terms of the environment, what kind of the legislations and policies, but also they can interpret these new complex and emerging protection issues in a humorous language. So if you engage with a special rapporteur on this particular theme and you have a confusing question, you don't know what to qualify this particular protection issue, whether this is extortion or it is something else, or it is uh, about trafficking or or other new complex legal questions that are coming in, then I think you need to convene a fora, whether you need to have an informal conversation or or even you can make what is your, your regular exit changes on, on this particular theme and 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 be as open as possible to convene actors outside the cluster because they can bring you different perspectives. Uh, I don't want to uh, to say more about it's all about the law and and of course lawyers and legal jargons. I mean, it comes to over um, complicate things, but it's it's not it's not the case i think we need to always to have an open conversation to keep the communication ongoing and and as much as possible how we can work together towards the data collection because there are huge challenges when it comes on data collection and how we harmonize the data and 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 also understanding the limitations even with these monitoring tools that we have and also, we need to also understand that also limitations to these human rights mechanisms and tools. So again, we're not saying it's not the ideal world that we live in, but we need always to use those tools for the better of the people that we are serving. Thank you. Thank you, Said. And before I just hand over to Francesco, if colleagues, uh, you wish to have you have questions in in uh, French or Spanish, Francesco can help. Uh, he is uh, fluent in both languages, and I think, Said, you're you're fluent in Arabic as well. So, if you have any questions uh, um, in these three languages, uh, colleagues can support you. But over to you, Francesco. Thank you, Said. Uh, so, Mane, there is a, a hand raised from Uta before. Yes, Uta, over to you. Thank you, Francesco. Hi colleagues, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. That was really, really useful. And uh, just I'm from OCHA uh, working on the HPC and I have a more general question concerning the HPC. Could you maybe um, elaborate a bit more on how the, 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 the matrix links to the production analytical framework and also the GF to the outcome indicators? I know it's, it's, it's very technical, but uh, it, it would be good for us to, to understand that better. Thank you. I'll hand over to Francesco, I think, first to 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 tackle this question. Thank you, Uta. Uh, can you, I had a broken uh, connection. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, Uta. It was uh, around the HPC, how the matrix links to the GF and also to the protection and analytical framework. OK, um, we will reach out. That's the initial question, <laughs> meaning that no, no, it's in plan. So uh, the first exercise we wanted to do with Said and colleagues was to actually come through with the matrix. Now we have it and uh, we have uh, a linkages. And then the second exercise we're doing within the GPC, but also with the IWG and the colleagues of the, the, of the protection partners, we are revising how to contribute with protection risk analysis to the general uh, um, HNO and GF process. So we have a workshop next week and then follow up on that. Uh, um, we we are looking into how to connect it better. So we have some reasoning, but we wanted to actually to connect together and see. 
that's my quick answer. Then Francesco, yes, continue, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, uh, I had actually maybe a common critical challenge question for the participants, but if it's not the participants, maybe Said or Brennan or colleagues. One of the major challenge, so um, we, of course, the law, the, um, the obligation are very helpful for advocacy and so on. But when we're doing protection analysis and then we're publishing document for protection analysis specifically from the side of the cluster, there is a very big challenge, which is about the language and about being public with using specific analysis. Uh, one of the lessons learned that we have from last year across operation is that in critical countries, namely Myanmar or other critical countries, we are self-censoring ourselves when we do analysis because we can't openly speak about with human right language. So my question is, of course, protection analysis gives us the possibility, the protection risk language, to tackle um, the analysis from not a human right perspective. So we can, from the cluster side, present those analysis, and then this matrix the objective is to help us out in having a dialogue with human rights actors. Um, but does this alone address the challenge? So can we really incorporate human rights language in our protection analysis? And uh, how do we do in those contexts where human rights are actually uh, a difficult elements to speak uh, openly within the clusters? So there's a question for some of the participants that I see, but if no, nobody's coming on that, happy to hear from you, Said or Brennan, uh, just a, a reflection on that. Or Samani. It's over to you, Brennan. I mean, I think we we have that challenge, Francesco. I mean, with with just protection language as well. Um, so, I mean, I look at protection monitoring. I think that we have examples of some countries. They do two types of reports: one internal, one external. Um, and I think the important thing is that we don't we have to fight that self censor. We can't self censor ourselves. There are other ways to do the analysis, but how we share the data and the findings is something else. Um, so I would say we we continue to incorporate human rights language and laws and policies into our analysis always, but the way we share that information, who we're going to share it with, then is another thing to be discussed. And and I know there, are, I mean, there's always, I think, protect POWs that are internal and external as well. Some don't get shared, uh, or, you know, on the website because of the sensitivities. So I think it's important that protection cluster members identify these sensitivities, but also make sure that we're not self-censoring on assumptions. Um, yeah, get there. Thank you, Brennan. Um, Emilia, I don't know whether your hand up is to also answer Francesco, but please over to you, but we can also come back to Francesco's uh, question again. No, it's, it's to answer uh, Francesco's question. And thanks, I'm Emilia from OHCHR. We work together with Said. And thank you very much, colleagues, for, for this great presentation. I think it's a key question. And, and Brenda and I would agree that, you know, we, we are seeing um, that, that colleagues are uh, refraining themselves uh, to, to speak about protection in public documents or with the counterparts. But we need to keep a minimum. We need to keep that door open with the government and also think internally as protection actors, what is the advocacy strategy, strategy to, to put up on these, these protection issues. And that can be with other partners, with third parties, that can be with special procedures, with mechanism. But we cannot stop completely ourselves from doing it because if it's not us then nobody will do it and it will be completely lost and we we cannot come back so i would strongly encourage to keep that even to a minimum or like brainstorm to find other partners to to take on that advocacy over thank you thank you emilia and uh, just to add also um from the gp side i think um we uh, we as i mentioned a few examples of the advocate the recent advocacy that we have undertaken and we have been operating in quite sensitive um you know uh, locations and uh, sometimes we are just feeding that information from the um country level colleagues and taking it at, upon us not to have implications i know there's always a bit of uh, sometimes uh, depending on which agencies um a, a risk factor 
factor about operational implications. Um, so this is also a role that GPC plays. Um, you know, we we are here both uh, as GPC, but uh, you know, to be able to um, amplify the voice that in some certain um, uh, situations, sensitive situations, maybe the country is not able to. But as Brennan said, it's um, that information will can be fed to us. Uh, you know, not publicly, but then we would be able to take um, th th those advocacy channels. And I think it's also very important um, to also map and identify the various um, channels and champions. You know, it's not always the, the work of necessarily protection partners to be at the forefront of um, advocacy in the country. There might be other um, stakeholders that are better positioned, are in a better relationship or are, um, um, are able to take that advocacy more forward, uh, be it the, you know, the HCT raising it at that level. Sometimes the donors are very, very effective in in uh, channeling that advocacy to the governments directly so that also has to be mapped uh, but um, that doesn't take away from the uh, you know that that uh, our protection analysis has to be grounded in that in that human rights work and and um, exactly as Brennan said I think it's it's more the after how do we share that information is it public is it private what how do we channel that protection analysis and use it for advocacy thank you um I see. Um, Francesco, there's a lot of chat in the conversation in a language that I don't understand, unfortunately, but if you think that it's no. relevant to others that uh, you want to share, maybe you can also summarize. So, um, you know, if colleagues are interacting. No, colleagues are chat. just asking if the guidance will be available in Spanish. Yes, and okay. I will also suggest uh, French. I say that we have it in plan. We don't know exactly when. Uh, so we will come back to everybody when, uh, uh, when we have a clear ideas. But uh, um, of course, uh, uh, we will do it uh, this soon. And then there is a colleague, I don't know if he wants to come in from, uh, uh, I, I don't want to mispronounce the name, from Ethiopia. Uh, same challenge for Ethiopia here too. Previously, there was a legislation that specifically restricted NGOs to work on right, but now it's been rep repealed, but still is a challenge to use human right language. Um, they can be, it can be sensitive. So just reinforcing on that. Um, that we don't know other comments. Yes. Maybe I come back to the to the topic on my side because, of course, I, I raised the question because it's one of the things we are discussing quite widely with our colleagues uh, in the cluster, with Said and and, and generally. Um, from our side, one of the reasons that pushed us to work first on the protection risk definition and now in this human right in the human risk human right matrix is that indeed we cannot uh, refrain ourselves to do the correct analysis. Uh, that's uh, it's a given uh, we have to find the best way to do it. But of course, we have to be very, very sensitive on the way we build together that analysis. So the way we engage actors when we do the analysis and not, it's not just about just the publishing of the document. And uh, there are two different uh, processes. So the idea of, of this matrix as any other um, process of reflection we are having is that we find the best way to communicate, to have an open communication with human rights actors when it's possible, both during the analysis and during after, and after the analysis. And we don't stop that communication. Um, that there are ways of doing it. And uh, it's fundamental that on our side, we are very clear on prioritizing what are the most critical protection risks, and then uh, looking and seeking support to see what are the, 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 the human rights consideration behind that. Of course, Within the protection clusters, probably we can't address all of those because the protection cluster has to provide humanitarian assistance, of course, under a human rights framework, but there are other actors that maybe they can intervene and they can act. So it's fundamental that we share our analysis. So again, uh, we didn't solve the, ch the, the challenge, I think. Uh, the challenge is quite open, but I think it's just from, from my side and GPC on the analysis to invite, even to get in touch with us and find ways of uh, moving forward with that analysis and, and have a human rights center approach. Um, but I stop there and over to, to you, Saman and Said. I see what's to comment. Thank you, Francesco. Said, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I agree with you when it comes to the analysis and when uh, when there are also issues when it comes to publishing and what we put out in uh, and, and disseminate, etc. Uh, but I also see this protection analysis to what extent it does inform programming and and also response uh, because sometimes we might uh, I mean from this analysis come out that there is 
other particular groups we have not looked at. And also perhaps the cluster needs to consider uh, which are the most responders that are accessing these particular groups. So for example, uh, just uh, in the last two years, our colleagues in Somalia did kind of minority mapping that informed later on targeting across the other sectors. So these, I think, uh, and uh, in, the, in the guidance that we started working on, and, uh, and by the way, uh, uh, I'll, I'll send you by tomorrow a clean version. It, it has come, uh, like significantly progressed uh, over the last uh, few weeks, is, is to suggest what, what kind of partnerships we need to have when it comes to data collection, when you do protection monitoring exercises, uh, and how we carry this particular analysis to the program cycle. Because, I mean, I, I still struggle to see the HRP as a reflection of the HNO. Because you see, uh, the HNO is, is kind of a whole list of needs. But when it comes to the HRPs, we go to, to address five out of seven or four out of seven. Uh, perhaps it's geographical access. We don't have the capacity. We don't have the expertise to work with these particular groups. But I don't know to what extent you, you see this effort when it comes to the, to the human rights uh, based analysis could inform that yeah, perhaps we need to work with these particular groups or if there it comes to certain geographical locations that are mostly impacted by violations, by certain abuses, perhaps, yeah, do we need to shift gears? But yeah, but uh, I don't see this is limited only to advocacy, whether member states or, or, uh, or in-country uh, HCT advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Said. Of course, yes. Thank you for highlighting the, you know, programming and response aspect of the protection analysis as well. Of course, it's it's not in silo. Thank you so much. Um, I also just wanted to to um, hear. Um, kind of read out or echo what Martina mentioned. A lot of you might be familiar with Martina. Martina um, leads uh, together with um, Catherine from NRC, um, the Law and Policy Task Team. And uh, yes, shout out to Martina. I didn't know whether you're in a meeting. Okay, I'll hand over to you, Martina, to explain also. And uh, if you want uh, to a little bit introduce yourself and, and also the support that the from the Law and Policy side that you can provide to, to colleagues in country. Thank you. No, thanks so much, uh, Saman, and I didn't want to, you know, steal the show, but no, but really just to say for colleagues, we have, of course, a, a law and policy task team under the Global Protection Cluster, and a lot of the colleagues that are here today, uh, Saeed, uh, the colleagues from DRC, IRC, your, your organization are all well represented there as well. Um, we have um, some, even some earmarked fundings, actually, to support some of the national level activities on law and policy on internal displacement, so we can help you for example, even if uh, you would like to organize a workshop with the government, uh, you know, on, on some of these issues, whether it is around discussing the implementation, like the protection cluster in Niger last year did, we support them with some of the financial um, fundings to organize a, a big workshop looking at the existing IDP Act, the law on internal displacement in Niger, and looking at how can we move forward with the implementation, you know, so it was about raising awareness and uh, etc. So that's, for example, one, one way but of course we are happy to help you with conceptualizing some of these activities supporting some of your efforts the legal analysis where it is needed um, and we have also um, developed a project specifically on legal aid in humanitarian settings and we will have a session on that so I won't say much right now but I think that that's also an area of priority for us um, and feel free to reach out to learn more about it whenever 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 you want um, thank you so much Thank you, Martina. Thank you. Um, colleagues, do we have any other questions? No. So I think um, we are 80 minutes early and it's good. Uh, uh, I think everybody would appreciate, uh, you know, going a bit earlier and closing the session. Um, for sure, we will share the tools. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your interest in participating today. I hope you found it helpful and um, we will also share the contacts of resource people who are in today's session to be able to, if you have any follow-up questions after the meeting. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>